Friends, welcome to Leadosophy. You're here with an open mind, as always, because that is the rule, folks, and that is not the exception. Today's episode, where you're about to hear, is a conversation or a dialogue I had with Rob Alexander. He is, in full disclosure, my cousin, and he works at a small business development center in Ohio, and he helps people who are looking to start businesses, organizations. He helps them kind of get off the ground and provide direction, whatever they may need to get those uh, ideas into reality entrepreneurs. He works a lot with, with a lot of entrepreneurs. And Darren Gertis, he is a professor of management at Charleston Southern University. And he jumps on later on in the episode, probably about an hour in, uh, Darren j- jumps in, which I was super grateful for um, because he has a lot of great ideas on, on leadership. He has a podcast called Leadersmith. You should check it out. He's been doing that for quite some time. And even better is at some point in the podcast in the end, Darren's daughter jumps in and she works for Chick-fil-A, and she gave us a kind of quick crash course on organizational culture at Chick-fil-A and why she enjoys working there so much. So we talk about organizational effectiveness, and uh, she gives us a glimpse into the culture of, of Chick-fil-A and why that organization is so effective, So, and it's been why it's been able to thrive as long as it has. So great episode. I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Greetings, friends. I am Tim Woody, and welcome to Leadosophy. Leadosophy is the fusion of leadership and philosophical thought. Together, we will deepen our understanding of leadership using the tools of meaningful dialogue, reflection, and a general curiosity to learn from one another. We will crowdsource knowledge, staying within the bounds of leadership, followership, team dynamics, and organizational effectiveness. I hope you enjoy the show. Here we go. All right, friends, welcome to Leadosophy. You are here with an open mind because that is the rule and not the exception. I am happy to have, in full disclosure, my cousin, <laughs> Rob Alexander. Rob has, has decided to join me today to talk about organizational effectiveness. Uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to be on Rob, uh, one of Rob's podcasts uh, last year. Yeah. Uh, last, last spring, I think, last spring sometime. Um, so real quick, Rob, before, we, before I dive into kind of like the, the prompt of what we're going to talk about, can you just quickly give me your background, what you do, uh, just kind of so the audience is, is up to speed? Yeah, sure. Uh, vocationally, I run a small business development center um, out in Ohio. There are a thousand of these centers all across the country, but um, the one I run is one of the top 10 in the country. So, you know, a top 1% SBDC. Um, I sit on multiple boards of directors. I coach softball. Um, You know, I don't know. It feels like I just find my way into different leadership positions. And I think that's how God has gifted me and I enjoy it. I love to teach. And uh, I love to make a difference. I love to find some kind of big, hairy problem and, and try and tackle it, see if we can't do something. So is it safe to say you have been a part of, in your professional career, your adult life, you've been a, you've been a part of many organizations, small, large, different sizes, um, different purposes, right? Nonprofits, whatever. Is that it's accurate, correct? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've led three or four different organizations as the top executive. And then in my job now, we work with 350 businesses each year uh, of all sizes and at all stages. So yeah, I mean, yes, that's pretty much all I do. It seems like. <laughs> yeah, so, Brian lead. <laughs> yeah. So when I was on your podcast last spring, I, I you know, we talked about leadosophy and, and kind of that whole thing, but, um, in, in the preparation for the show, I, I researched the whole small business development side, and I was very intrigued about what you guys do for, for businesses within your local community. And um, I didn't know, it's one of those things where researching going on a sh- your show, I learned a bunch about those small community pieces. And I say small, you know, very important, obviously, um, mm-hmm. but small, how small parts of a community can, can kind of come together and support businesses like that. And, very noble work so if anyone out there is interested in kind of checking out small business development what they do i mean it's it's pretty impressive you guys have helped basically businesses start from the ground up right from nothing and in florida is that accurate most honestly like most people over 50 percent have some sort of business they've been dreaming about it and 
fear holds them back, life situations hold them back, but most of us at one time or the other have thought, you know, I would like to be my own boss. I think I'm ready. Um, and they're passionate about it. It's their dreams. So to, to do that kind of work to help people actually do something crazy to chase after a dream, super rewarding. And it's good for the community too, because where big businesses come from, they usually come from a small business and small businesses were just an idea in somebody's head. So, you know, I think it's a tragedy when a great idea goes to the great with somebody because they were just too scared or too worried about what people would think if they actually tried it. Yeah. Do you help people? So people who have an idea, right? They, because one of the things I talk about in organizations, organizations form, right? One of the main reasons an organization of two or more people come together is to solve some sort of problem, right? Yeah. To fill some gap or service that needs filled, right? Do you help people get over that fear hump? Like, so there's some people, right, that come to you with an idea, and but they haven't actually committed fully. Do you help them kind of take that next step? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it, it's a big step just to darken our doorway and make that appointment. But yeah, I, I think honestly, half of our conversations are not so much teaching skills as much as it is imparting a mindset into them. Um, the mindset of an entrepreneur that it's okay to take risks. It's okay to fail, you know, just don't get hung up on that word, you know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off and look for another problem, pivot in a slightly different way. Um, entrepreneurs have a very different relationship with fear than I think a lot of other people do. And so if you can get them. Can you explain think, that? Can you unpack that a little bit? What do you mean? What do you mean by it? Because we talked about this when I was on your show. Explain that. Yeah. Well, um, I think that they have, they just don't care. Yeah. They don't care if they fail. They don't care if people will talk about that because that's not what they care about. What they care about is solving problems. And so if they think that if they see this problem, they're going to go and try and solve that. If they don't have that solution that people want, all they're looking for is another problem to solve. It's just, it's how they're wired. I mean, they just don't care what other people think. And others are conditioned. Um, I, th I think you get conditioned. It may be bosses you've had, maybe parents you've had who have made you feel bad when you make a mistake or you don't perform up to expectations. And every time that happens, every time you color outside the lines and somebody says something, it's subtly teaching you not to take chances, not to color outside the lines. And, um, you know, those people, it, it's really hard for them to take that step and start a business because they're definitely afraid that it might not work and they might get a B minus in, in the great card of life. Right. That's a, that's a uh, very well put. Yeah. We talk, I remember talking about that when, when I was on your podcast and you, I remember you specifically talking about how entrepreneurs are wired differently. I remember having that discussion and uh, you just wonder, you know, it's kind of like the nature and nurture thing, right? How do people get like that? Um, but yes, I, I think the fear of failure, and I think it's not just starting a business. It's with a lot of things in life, right? We, we don't do things because we're afraid of failure um, it's that whole side, you know, I, I've talked about this with my wife a lot. It's that self-preservation, right? We want to avoid, yeah. you know, we want to avoid embarrassing situations, you know, things like that. And that's, you know, if you, if you fail, you might be embarrassed, right? And, uh, no yeah. one wants to feel that. So they just avoid the, uh, the, the situation that may cause that. So. Yeah. And the crazy part is, is <laughs> it's, it's really just an inflated view of yourself to even think that other people care that much about it. Right. You know, you start a business and it fails. Chances are 90 percent of people won't even notice until, you know, they happen to see you three years down the road. And that's if they even remember. Uh, right. you know, we magnify that stuff, but it isn't reality. Yeah, we can't get out of our own headspace. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, like you said about the ego, though, it's kind of like, you know, we it's one of those. OK, there's a bias about that where we view our own actions more highly than we actually should or what other people do. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's dive into this whole organizational effectiveness because I th I think you'll you'll be able to add to this conversation significantly significantly because one of the reasons you've seen multiple organizations, um, both you've been embedded within these organizations, but you've also helped people start organizations from scratch and probably seen some evolve right, and then some yeah. maybe not evolve or ultimately fail. Right, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm safe to say that you've seen organizations that didn't succeed. Is that safe to say? Oh yeah, yeah. 
I mean, it's part of the, you know, the pro you be in the business long enough, you're going to see organizations that, you know, got off the ground and then just kind of sputtered out or failed uh, miserably. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, half of them, probably yeah. most of them. It's yeah. It's a very finicky thing starting a business. I mean, from what I've it heard. Is. Yeah, so it is. All right. So what I want to talk about, so I kind of, I wrote some stuff down and, you know, we have a Facebook group, Leadosophy. It's a private group. Um, but what I put on there is that for an organization to thrive, uh, the question is, are there any necessary conditions required internal to that organization and its members, right? And by necessary conditions, I mean that an organization will be ineffective at a minimum, right? If these conditions are not met or these conditions are not part of the organization or the organization will fail completely. So one, one of the things I'm trying to do, Rob, is kind of dig up the roots of what it means to be an effective organization. So I'm, in, I'm interested in these conditions, right? So, and I think we can delineate here in this conversation, you and I, uh, between what conditions are needed just for the organization to survive, but mm-hmm. then what conditions are needed for it to thrive and, and maintain itself over a long run, right? So I think there's a difference yeah. there, right? Uh, yeah. So just what, what conditions are needed for the organization just to get off the ground and make some, make, get some momentum going? But then if this organization is going to sustain itself over a long term, if it's going to grow, if it's going to be healthy, what conditions need to be a part of that organization? And I'm sure we'll talk about things like maybe leadership or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I start with, and we kind of talked about this before, you know, the podcast started was, was a purpose, right? When a business or an entrepreneur comes to you with an idea, it's, it, that person's got to have some sort of idea for a purpose. Right? It's the existential purpose of an organization. Why do we exist? Right. So every organization I feel should be able to answer that question as well as every one of its members. If they can't answer the question, why do they exist? Then I, I think there's a disconnect. at some, you know, somewhere in the organization, um, you know, some organizations form to solve an immediate problem. And then once that problem is solved, uh, the organization may dissolve on purpose because it's no longer needed. And again, right. this might be a nonprofit organization. This may be a business like you were dealing with, or it could be just a community organization, right? Maybe an organization forms to tackle homelessness or hunger or poverty or something like that uh, within the community. And there's no, maybe there's no financial aspect of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I want to kind of talk about that, you know, I want to get behind the why I want to have this conversation um, because I th- think it's essential that, that we filter or frame what it means to be an effective organization, right? So how do we assess organizational effectiveness? How do we talk about it amongst organizational members? How do we judge our effectiveness? Um, And what assumptions are we bringing about organizational effectiveness? So I know that was a mouthful, but I wanted to kind of set the stage, um, you know, especially with someone like you, because I know you have been around for a while. You have been in various levels of organizations, management, top management, executive level, and all the way down to, to the ground level, right? When you started off. Sure. So, oh, yeah. Um, so what, what are your initial, I know that was a lot, I said a lot, but what maybe, what was some intuitive things that were running through your head as I was talking? Well, at first I thought it, it's going to be hard to think of things that you need just to even exist, just to survive with any kind of organization. And, and the thing that came to my mind was you, you use the word purpose. I, I, I tend to think of it as you solve a problem or, or you address a pain point or you're giving people something that they need, they want. So it's either a pain or a gain that you exist to address. And you can call that purpose in the business world. That's, that's seeing a problem and, and, and fixing it or giving people what they want. But, you know, even, even something like we were talking about, Coaching softball, you know that that is a that is an organization of sorts, but it, it exists to solve a pain point. Kids get bored. Kids need exercise. That's a good one. Yeah, that's true. So, why would anyone want to come play softball if it didn't do anything to make their life better? So, it, it, to me, base level, what you do has to make life better for somebody if you're even going to exist. Because why else would they want to hand you hard-earned money? Why would they want to give you your time? Why would they want to show up and work for you if what you do doesn't even matter to anybody? Right. That's uh, very well said. I, I like what you said about the softball because I'd actually, I'd made some notes yesterday and I was thinking about, because I was trying to think about organizations that are not business related. And the first mm-hmm. thing that came to mind were, 
you know, a soccer team or a baseball team or, you know, sports metaphors always come to my mind for better yeah. or worse. But uh, these organizations exist, like you said, for, for a reason. And I never thought about it was what problem it was solving. But that's yeah. an interesting way of looking at that. Is, is competition a reason to exist for, for, like, for kids and sports and sports teams and organizations I like think, that? Is, I think if, if some kids – thrive on competition and they that that gives them a thrill like those kids tend to go on and become lawyers and stuff because they it's 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 that thrill of victory that's something they crave that that's a want um and so yes you know like i said you're either you either have a painkiller that solves a pain point or you have a game creator that gives someone a game that they're looking for if that game is the thrill of victory it's facing down an opponent and coming out on top you're absolutely giving them what they want, which is simply an opportunity to go face to face with someone. Right, right. What's and the there's sports and individuals. You know, sometimes you just want it to be on you. You're kind of a uh, a maverick, and you want to know that I can I can do this. Other times, you crave camaraderie. You know, maybe you're you're very social. You're an extrovert. So to to play on golf sounds horrible because you're out there by yourself. But being on a football team sounds fantastic. So is it safe to say that people join organizations with, for, with multiple motivations, right? And there's no one single motivation, obviously, that, that people join organizations for, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about churches. I mean, people, people go to a church for all different kinds of reasons. Maybe they're trying to meet God. Maybe they just want to make friends. Yeah. Maybe they're single and want to meet a nice guy. Uh, maybe they don't even know why. They just walk in. You know, maybe someone invited them and they didn't want to say no. I mean, there's, there's many reasons why people do many things for sure. Yeah, the same thing for joining a softball team or, or whatever, right? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I think the difference between that of why someone joins an organization, I think that's different than why people start an organization, right? Because if you're going to start an organization, again, you've noticed some sort of pain point. You've noticed that there's some gap that needs to be filled. So you're deliberately taking an action to start this organization, right? the difference between someone joining it just kind of arbitrarily. Yeah. And then there's that subtle difference between what you said and just thinking that you can do it better than someone else. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, which was it in a way kind of addressing a gap because you think you would do it differently or better. Yeah. And, and that's, I'm, honestly, that's how the whole economy works. You know, why are there 50 different pizza brands? Well, each one does it a little bit different. Some sell based on, how good their delivery is. Some it's the ingredients, some it's the price, some it's like how many celebrities have walked through our doorway. Right. You know, it's all pizza, but they found a different way to, to attract people. Would you say there's a difference between coming up with a different product or service vice improving upon a, a product or service, right? Because you can have mm -hmm. five different pizza chains and they're all different. Um, but try to improve on something that no one's ever done before or whatever. I think that's kind of different, right? A little different. Oh yeah. I mean, it takes a different kind of a person to just to totally change the game rather than incremental improvement or, sure. you know, slight twist on things. Sure. So those are really creative people and bold again, because you're putting yourself out there trying something that nobody else has done. Sure. Let's talk about Rob. Let's talk about some of the organizations you've been, embedded within or nested within over your professional career. Uh, I want to talk about this idea between collaborative environments and competitive environments. Have you seen a, a, a spectrum of that in your, in your professional life being in different organizations? Is one better than the other? Does one help an organization be more effective, maybe less effective? What do you, what do you think about that? Oh, I think that, I think about the organization I lead. I have about 20 different people who report up to me. And I, I think I've got elements of both. You know, there, there's definitely a, a rah-rah team atmosphere. Like, look at all this great stuff we're doing. This is because of all of us collaborating. But I also don't hesitate to, to put people's metrics out there and, and kind of have a little bit of a, uh, a healthy comparison, a measuring stick. Um, so that they want to be a little competitive and, and be towards the top of those lists. Um, I, I don't know. I guess there's a part of me that wonders, is, is one the right way for an organization or is it more personalized? You know, one, one of my 
Sorry, that's my dog. Maybe very competitive um, and needs to kind of see where they stack up against the others. Whereas another, that might really turn them off. They would much more be part of a cohesive unit that's accomplishing big things together. And no one person stands out as, you know, uh, the all-star of the team, so to speak. That makes sense. Totally makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It, it's a it's a balance and it's knowing who you have on your team and how to motivate them, I suppose. Yeah. And I think everyone responds differently too, to to competition and, and collaboration. Everyone every person is different. You're dealing with unique personalities every you know. Yeah, so I, I guess I don't you know, if, if you know everyone's different, do you have to pick one side or the other as an organizational leader? Or can you have elements of both and do that in a healthy way? It works. Yeah, which is a, a very delicate balance, right? Yeah. You know, there's a del- delicate way to line to walk, especially when you're in a leadership role and trying to get people to work together. Do you, I mean, how do you measure, what, what do you use? What do you use to measure organizational effectiveness? What do you look at? Is it very metric based? You know what I mean? Or what, what are you looking at to, when you look at your organization, what are the different things that come to mind when, when you ask the question, are we effective as an organization? Well, I think that I'm, I naturally gravitate towards statistics and metrics and, and maybe that's just like the old baseball player coming out. Me. Um, and I have a very unique personality that's been that way. However, I think as I'm getting older and more mature, I'm definitely realizing that I don't think people want to work for that kind of a guy um, who's really just looking out for his own statistics, you know, so to speak. They want to be working for a guy who's going to be quick to give them credit, to um, praise them in front of other people. And I've learned that actually uh, my organization is much more effective when I take the spotlight off of me at the top of the organization and put it in it, put it on those people and empower them to let them go out and make the difference. Uh, it, it frees me up to just leave instead of being the one that has to perform all the time. Um, that's, man, I've learned that a lot in the last couple of years as my team has grown and just knowing I can't be the bottom. I can't do it all. And I had to give that up kind of unwillingly, but then I watched like the growth just explode because they were empowered because they got to be the ones telling the stories. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I tend to be metrics, but um, I'm learning. It's, it's a lot about stories of, of changed lives, changed perspectives, whatever it is you do, you know, hopefully that thing improves lives somehow in small ways or big ways. You know, I, I tend to tackle big issues, but if you make a little part that makes somebody's motorcycle funner to ride, faster to ride, I mean, that changes their life in a small way, but it's still a good change, a change that they wanted. And I can go home feeling good about that. Yeah, I think, you know, you bring up a lot of points too about the metrics and then, you know, you talked about stories, right? So it's kind of like the the analytical side versus the human side of an organization, right? So again, a very delicate balance to walk and and I think any organization if they're going to thrive over the long term they have to figure out how to walk that line right because you can't you can never forget that it's the human side of the organization that's going to propel it along the way you know what I mean yes yeah. you got to look at the metrics and the, and the data and you have to be able to adapt to those metrics right I think I think for an organization to thrive they have to be able to look at some of those analytical pieces of the organization and say okay we, we are looking, you know, looking at this data, these metrics, and, you know, maybe we're not as effective as we can be here, so we need to alter course, right? So I think there's some, I don't know, would you agree there's got to be some sort of adaptability and flexibility for an organization if they're going to thrive over the long run? Uh, they have to be adaptable to changing conditions on the ground, right? Is that safe to say? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you won't survive if you're not pivoting as the world changes around you. Yeah, and, you're, you know, as your stakeholders change, you know, obviously – you know, I mean, stakeholders are, you know, the, the mother's milk of organizational effectiveness. Are you, are you pleasing the stakeholders, right? And yeah. Maybe your stakeholders are internal, external, uh, you know, they're everywhere, especially in a business, you know, who are your customers and are you pleasing them? <laughs> so, Well, metrics can always be fudged too. And I, I think when you start chasing numbers, you're probably in a dangerous place as an organization. Um, metrics shouldn't be the end. It, it's, 
it's just evidence that what you're doing is working and stories you know if what you're doing is working you should have stories so in my opinion are you, you saying the, the metrics should tell a story is that what you mean correct yes mm -hmm. <laughs> if if you're doing good work you'll have stories and your metrics ought to really tell a story themselves too but if you think you're working just for metrics that's boring that sucks you know um, i don't want to show up every day to make a number grow i want to show up because i think what we're doing is matter it matters to people yeah it's, it's people remember stories way way more than they remember statistics and i think as organizational leaders we have to remember that it's it is stories of how what they're doing is helping and changing people in the world that i think creates more of a positive culture atmosphere that makes people happy to come to work or come to that group whatever it is I'm thinking about, you know, I, I, I call it a purpose. You call it problem solving. Don't you think that there's got to be some, you know, it's not all the leader's job to, to do this either, but there's got, people have to connect with the mission of the organization, right? And how do you, which is easier said than done. You know that, like, how do you, I, I don't think, I don't think it's not like, you don't want buy-in, right? It's not like you shouldn't have to sell toasters to the organizational members, right? You want them to be connect. You want them to find some, intrinsic meaning or connection with what they're doing right and as the organization grows and the missions grow and the problems are greater uh in number and complexity I, it's harder i think maybe to to keep connecting to that purpose or why we exist and i, th I think that's one of the you know one of the also one of the delicate things about organizational effectiveness is how do we continue to aspire to inspire or create an inspirational environment that people are continually able to connect to why we exist. What are we here to do and do we do it well? Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, and I kind of knew that would come up and it's easy for me to, to believe ex everything you just said because at pretty much everywhere I've worked has had an amazing mission that I could believe in. But not every organization solves some great societal problem. That doesn't mean we don't need plumbers in this country, that we don't need factories that turn out metal pipes. So if you're working in a factory running a machine that spits out metal pipes, how does the purpose of that organization motivate you to come to work every day? And, and I don't know, I haven't been in that environment, but I sit there and think, you know, maybe it's more about the people and how you're treated. And does, does your boss know what your life is like outside of that factory? Does he care? Does she care? Right. You know, they, do they allow me freedom to, to have things outside of work that matter to me? You know, why, why does somebody want to show up to that kind of a, a factory job when making pipes doesn't make you feel good in and of itself when you go home at night? You know what I mean? That's what I, I struggle with. I do know what you mean. I was thinking, you know, I was trying to very, listen very intently to what you're saying, but I couldn't help about thinking. So my father-in-law, um, retired recently, he sold his construction company at a large construction company in South Bend, Indiana, and he sold it. Um, and there are various facets to, to this construction company, everything from, from masonry, bricklaying to, you know, everything the construction company does. And I've thought about that. So as I've talked about leadership over the last couple of years, you know, it's very, it's easy to talk about leadership when it comes to like the corporate world, you know what I mean? Like those businesses. But when you get into some of those hard skills, like construction companies or whatever, or if, like you said, if you have a plumbing company of 12 members, you know, maybe because I'm not a plumber, I, yeah, I, I think people become plumbers for obviously they get into that business for, for various reasons. Um, but people, I'm assuming people pursue a, a plumber's career because they enjoy that where they get intrinsic motivation because they enjoy working with pipes to some degree. Right. So they have the intrinsic motion for uh, motivation for joining an organization that is a plumbing company. Um, but then, like you said, how do they sustain that over the long term if they have a boss who is condescending or treats them poorly? Like, you know, that's the human side of the organization, even if it's a very hard skill organization, like a plumbing company, you got to have yeah. a human side of that place too. Because at the end of the day, don't you want your organization members to be happy? I believe it's like psychological pain and pleasure. A leader creates one or the other. Creates, you create more, more pleasure than you create pain psychologically. And I'm not talking about the hedonistic pleasure, right? I'm talking about 
deep, meaningful happiness, right? Because, yeah. I mean, don't we want to be happy? Like, you know, I don't think anyone wants to go be part of an organization where they're going to be miserable every day. Yeah. It's, is happiness, is that one of the conditions for an organization to thrive? Must there be some level of happiness on a deeper fundamental level? Uh, is that part of an organization? Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, and it, prior to, to hopping on here, I thought one of those conditions that allows an organization to thrive, maybe not survive, is just the, that organization values your health. Not just physical health, but emotional health, mental health, all that stuff. Spiritual health, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that healthy employees will perform better and they will stay longer. I, I have no doubt about that. In every organization, if you really sat down and thought about it, it does serve a purpose. It does have a mission. But sometimes that organization can be so big that every you know one individual job, you can lose sight of that. My my wife works for Anthem Insurance, huge company. I look at what she does is, is pressing buttons on a keyboard or you know pushing papers. It, it, you can lose sight of why do why do we even need medical insurance in the first place? You know, you're just approving and denying claims all day. You you can lose sight of the fact that those are real people, and um, you know, being able to have that insurance gives them safety, peace of mind, all that stuff. And so, maybe what you do can make you feel good instead of it. Just it all it only matters like is my boss nice to me? Sure. And so, really, it, it's on that organization to remind people to tell stories that you're you are all an important part of a bigger story than hitting this metric or processing this many claims in a day. I think it's easy, and especially some of the larger organizations, or as an organization grows, it gets, it gets bigger. I always think it's, it's easy for people to get dehumanized, right? Yeah. They become just kind of cogs in the wheel, kind of it's like a mechanistic environment. Yeah. Uh, it's the, you know, you have an office of 40 people, like you said, punching buttons on a computer. And it's, you get wrapped up in the data and the metrics and all of a sudden people are just pieces, man, pieces of a, of a chessboard, right? And they're not human people. And it's like, dude, how can you connect to, to the purpose of what you do in the organization if, if your leadership team or the management team just kind of sees you as a, as a cog in the wheel, man? And it's not that, you know, sometimes, yeah, we, we definitely have to come together. We're, we're part of the machine. We have to solve some problem. But at the end of the day, it's like, dude, I want to find purpose in what I do and I want to be inspired by what I do because I think that's yeah. the key to longevity. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. You know I, I think about, again, my wife's situation. Does she want to go 110% just to make Anthem another dollar? You know, Anthem's a billion dollar company. You know, it's stockholders getting rich off of that effort. Uh, probably not. That's not going to motivate her. Um, she goes 110% because she knows her boss appreciates her and, and they tell her that often and she gets rewarded when she does that. You know, it, it is for her, it's not to help Anthem succeed. Yeah. You know, That's some of the big companies, yeah, they, they do kind of dehumanize people. They're, they're out there to, to appease stockholders, you know, at the yeah. highest level. Yeah. And again, it's, uh, you know, I've never been the CEO of a large company that has a huge stockholder contingent that I'm trying to please. But, and I'm sure that's very hard to find that balance. And you know, maybe some CEOs are better at it than others. Um, sure. At the end of the day, uh, you know, you have stockholders. It's like, you know, it can be a very cutthroat environment. And I understand that. And, and again, not, not judging that at all because I've never been in those shoes. But um, again, I, I think you still have to always come back to the human piece. Yeah, because again, those those shareholders, those stockholders, uh, they will only go so far with with and on the backs of the people that are doing the mission, right? Mm -hmm. That are solving that problem or, or solving that pain point. It's the people in the trenches that's going to give the stockholder, you know, better share returns or whatever. So, you know, it's yeah, very. You know, it's a symbiotic relationship, man. At the end of the day, and it gets back to the, the the metrics versus the stories. I mean, I really feel like you need both. Those metrics are important. You do want to, you do want to make sure that the business is profitable. That ensures that that business is going to be there in five years, and it's still creating jobs in your community. And you're going to you're going to still have a job. Sure. You know, if metrics aren't going up, that's usually not a good sign for your business. Well, and at but, the end of the day, it's the metrics. Right? It'll be the metrics that you know. Once you run out of money, you run out of money. So. Yeah. 
<laughs> you know, yes. no way to get get around that. I I recently finished the. Uh, you didn't happen to see the, um, the we crashed. Uh, oh, about we work. About we work. I, no, I've not seen that yet. But. It's it's pretty. You from a business uh, perspective, you would find it very entertaining. I I want to watch it. It's a good reminder. It's uh, it's really good. It's one of those, you know, I look at the company like we work and it was one of those, yeah, you know, they had their purpose. They were solving a problem, um, you know, and the company grew exponentially and it was one of those environments where it was very story heavy, right? Almost 100% exclusively focused on the story and having fun and, yeah. you know, creating a happy environment where everybody has fun and plays beer pong or whatever they're doing, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, maybe that model doesn't work either. <laughs> you know right. I mean? So, because at the end of the day, it was the metrics that sunk the company. You know, yeah. the yeah. Uh, a lack of focus on the yeah. financial viability. <laughs> so, you would love it. You have to watch it, man. It's it's really good. Ping ping pong tables are not like a silver bullet for company culture. I think some it's definitely like a thing in entrepreneurial world. <laughs> ping pong tables and nap pods, dude. That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> No, it definitely uh, was not the long-term strategy. And, you know, there there was probably a, maybe a way to to do that, but again, it is, like you said, because um, you are a metrics person, at some at some point you have to not only look at the metrics and take them seriously, but uh, you can't, like you said, fudge the metrics, right? And you can't, you got to try to look at the the metrics without bias, or try to tailor the metrics to the way you think it should be. Does that make yeah. sense? You yeah. The more than anyone, so. Oh yeah, I, I got metrics I like to talk about, and I got metrics I really don't like to talk yeah. about. <laughs> right? Be yeah, because yeah, exactly. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's my quick WeWork thing. Or uh, we crashed. Great, great. Jerry Leto was awesome in that. Anyway. Um, back to necessary conditions for an organization to just exist. And I wanted maybe another 10, 15 minutes, and we can wrap this up because I am mindful of your time. Um, and t I appreciate your wife. Thanks for letting you be on here rambling with me for an hour. Um, but it's commitment and accountability. Organizational members, you think that that is a necessity for organizational members, no matter how small or large, there has to be kind of a commitment to that problem solving purpose, or why we are here. And there's got to be accountability. Does that make sense? Like we have to be accountable to each other. Um, and again, maybe this is for an organization to thrive, maybe not necessarily just to survive. Um, but I think it's as I told you before the show started, I want to get away a little bit from always talking about leadership because I yeah. think every organizational member needs to, to look in the mirror and say, I'm accountable for my organization to be effective. You know, I'm yeah. not just an innocent bystander here. I'm not just a victim. I, I am here to make a difference in this organization and I'm committed to the cause uh, and I'm accountable to the cause. If, if I'm not contributing to that and you figure out why or how to do that better. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, well, what if you, what if you lacked one of those things? Let's say when when you do not hold people accountable, what happens? I really think that becomes a virus in the organization. Yeah. Uh, if if you if you don't hold somebody accountable for poor performance or not being a team player, other people are going to realize. Well, why should I try if this person's not trying at all and there's no repercussion? Why why should I not just show up and just screw around all day? So I, I think if you don't have accountability that will become a cancer and eventually that will probably bring you down so i would say that might be a necessity commitment i'm curious what you mean by that word yeah so a good point um when i think of commitment and i i think that there's obviously various levels of commitment but i think there's got to be some base level of a commitment to the purpose of the organization right talking about that problem solving or filling that pain or solving the pain point filling a gap Every organizational member has to have some level of commitment to that cause. Okay, that's the, why does my organization exist? Okay, that's the reason why we exist. I am committed to that, right? And again, the commitment that we can obviously, commitment levels come in various shades and sizes, um, but there's got to be some sort of spark for, for that organization to, to just thrive, or not thrive, but just survive. There's got to be some level of commitment by its organizational members. And I think it's easier uh, in the beginning, right? When two, like say two people start an organization, obviously they're going to be, commitment's going to be hundred percent probably. But as the organization grows, you know, and you get farther away from the top, you know, the CEO and the C-suite, 
there may be a waning commitment or just, you know, get diluted a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I, I probably sit on the fence a little bit with this one. Um, and I think of entry-level jobs like McDonald's. That's a classic example. Let's do it. That's I got a 14-year-old kid who wants to go find a job. Yep. Do I think he's going to go find a job at a place where he's committed to that thing? No, I think he's going to go find a job and he's going to hire a 14-year-old right. and, and um, gives him the hours he wants. So, as you said, people join organizations for different reasons. Yep. Sometimes it's a higher salary and that's it. Like, they could care less about what that company does. And maybe they'll stick around for a while because that thing's important to them. If you're not committed to what the company does, are you a great long-term employee who's, who's really going to drive that organization forward? Probably not. Right. At that point, you are just a cog in the wheel, but sometimes some businesses are built like machines. McDonald's is a great example. McDonald's could probably be successful even without awesome leadership because they have systems for everything. They might be successful with raw robots at the end of the day. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, so you, I you, think so you, you just probably debunked. survive without everyone being committed. I guess yeah, that's what I'm saying. You debunked. Yeah, you definitely kind of exploded that assumption of, of commitment. Um, on the flip side of that, if you have a healthy, thriving organization, maybe you get somebody who comes in completely non-committal, but then as they are immersed in this environment, it's a very positive environment. The environment is what I would call flourishing. Um, yeah. The, the cause is worthy and noble. Maybe someone can grow that commitment. It can grow from nowhere, I guess. You know, maybe that's yeah. possible. Yeah, yeah and, and I, th- I think to just survive, at least your leaders need to be committed. Maybe not every single staff person. And to thrive, you're absolutely right. You got everyone committed to what you're doing, you will thrive. Right. Um, and, and it doesn't always have to be your main product or service that, that does that. Um, like I'm going back to fast food. Think of Chick-fil-A. Okay, they compete with McDonald's, but I think that they approach it much differently. I really think their staff is trying to brighten people's day. Uh, you know, just just the friendliness and the attitudes is completely different. So yeah. their purpose, they're both feeding people, but their purposes might be a little bit different. Sure. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, there's definitely a... Uh marketable so i'm taking the the average of all the mcdonald's i've been to and all the chick-fil-a's i've been to and it's the happiness promotion level at the chick-fil-a's are way higher right than the mcdonald's and you wonder so actually my niece uh my 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 wife's niece uh my niece as well uh she got a job at chick-fil-a last year and dude yes it's very machine-like like like that's how they churn out so many (laughs) orders an hour but there's still that personal side of it, which is it's got to come top down, right? That culture has been built. Absolutely. It's not something that just happened overnight. It was built over a long term. And it's, you wonder how that, I always, I would love to know that I've never read the story of Chick-fil-A and kind of how that started that, you know, kind of the genesis of that, but how did that culture, how did that culture become what it is and how has it been able to sustain itself through probably generations now of, you know, or second generation of people that have worked there. So. Yeah. You should look into it because they are very deliberate about who they will let open a new franchise. Um, they're so wildly successful everywhere they put them. They could put thousands of these all over the country every year and they would all be fine, but they are, they slow walk starting a new one because they want to make sure the owner of that is completely bought in. Yeah. Um, to the philosophy of, of how you treat people and how you treat your employees. Well, that's what we were um, just talking about, right? Commitment. Yeah. It, it's be committed. It, 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 to me, thriving, I, I go so much to culture. And um, to me, culture has also been driven by what, what I would call core principles. I like actually defining those, getting them written, putting them on the wall, talking about them all the time. But whether you have them on a piece of paper or you don't, your business has core principles. They maybe aren't intentional, and if they're not intentional, they're probably not that great. Um, but I really think thriving organizations think a lot about what do we believe in, what do we stand on, what are we not going to compromise on, um, and it's 
it's so unique to them that if you put that same set of principles on anyone else's wall, it wouldn't even make sense. Right. So you're saying that core principles are having a belief system as an organization that's definitely a, a necessary condition for that organization to sustain itself over a long term to thrive. I would agree. I, I think so. I think that human beings have a natural tendency to want to belong. And part of that belonging and forming as a group, forming, storming, norming stuff is rallying around a set of core principles. Yeah. Something we can do then. Makes something us, we can connect to. We got to connect with something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a very good point. Very good point. Every culture has it. I mean, it, it's, it's as old as time. You know, that that's what makes culture so different and so beautiful and so unique is that they are so different. But to that culture, it's so meaningful, even if we don't understand it. Right. Yeah, that's a great point, Ron. Great point. What else? Any other final thoughts as we kind of wind down here? Any final thoughts on organizational effectiveness in general? Anything you want to throw out on the airwaves? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, again, I'm going to aim small, small businesses. You, if you're the leader of an organization, um, you got to do what works for you. For me as a leader, there are things that, that I'm not good at and there are things that I'm great at. And so I need to build a culture. I need to build an organization that really takes advantages of my strengths and kind of minimizes my weaknesses because it's small. I mean, a lot is going to be dictated by how well I lead. So I don't think you can be all things to all people. I don't think there's a perfect organizational structure or culture you got to do what works for you um at at a, at a smaller level i think at a larger level you can hire people that um allow you to fine tune uh, the machine so to speak but organizations can look all different kinds of ways it can all be effective too yeah i agree i think strengths and weaknesses is a, is a very that's very important and i think it's it becomes more, it becomes magnified as the organization grows. Mm-hmm. I've seen organizations out there, I think, and you probably know this, you know this way better than I do, but um, the pain points that come with organizational growth, right? Yeah. There's so many pain points that come with growth. How do we adapt to that? You know, how do we specialize in one area? How do we continually pass on information and knowledge to different areas of the organization as they get more distant and if it may be the core business or the core office yeah um, it's very hard to do and you know i think if an organization is going to thrive um, one of the necessary conditions is there has to be continual focus on technical competence right we have to be technically competent in what we do we have to be able to adapt to what we do and knowledge has to flow freely through that organization knowledge and information uh, we can't hold on to information because we have an agenda you start getting those competitive environments where people are holding on to information, not letting it flow freely. Um, you know, that organization is, is, I think it's going to sink eventually. That's just my personal opinion and that's an assumption, but um, I've seen it. Right? I've seen it. Yeah. And I think even at a deeper level than that, it comes down to um, humility and self-awareness. And you need to have the humility to understand that not everything I do is great and I can be better. And the awareness to even realize that things aren't optimal. In some ways, things are weak. So if you can't develop those two skills, you probably aren't going to improve because you think everything's good and you're awesome. Um, so, Everything is awesome. <laughs> yep. And not, yeah. you know, speaking from experience, but, you know, again, as I get older, I start to realize uh, the more humble I am and allow other people to lead and take credit and do awesome things, Honestly, like the organization is doing better, but it also reflects on me again. Yeah, I hear. We had we just had someone jump in, Darren. Can you hear me? I can. How are you? I'm doing well, Darren. Uh, we have in the in the in the group here, uh, Rob Alexander. Um, Rob, can you briefly just kind of tell Darren what you do and kind of you you know while you're in here? Yeah. Hey, Darren. Tim and I have been talking a while, but anyways. Uh, I happen to be Tim's cousin, but um, I run a small business development center. We help um, hundreds of businesses get started and, and grow out here in Ohio. Um, so, yeah, that's my kind of interest in leadership. 
Yeah. Awesome. So Darren, yeah, Darren, can you just introduce yourself to Rob? I obviously you and I have talked multiple times, uh, but yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm a management professor at uh, Charleston Southern in South Carolina. Uh, and, uh, anything related to leadership I find fascinating. So, uh, built multiple leadership programs. Tim and I, as he said, talked in the past before and just wanted to drop in and see what Tim was talking about. This no, was interesting. I'm, I'm glad you joined. Um, like I said, Rob and I have been, we've been rapping for about an hour now. Uh, we've been talking about organizational effectiveness kind of broadly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I told, I told Rob, you know, one of my, as I, as I pivot a little bit on my podcast, I, I'm not getting away from leadership specifically, Darren, but I'm going more broadly with organizational effectiveness. Cause I think, okay. I think leadership is a piece of that, but I think there's so much more to organizational effectiveness broadly, you know, from followership, team dynamics, team effectiveness. Uh, so this, what we've been talking about is, you know, kind of what are some of those conditions that are needed in an organization. And as you know, Darren, there's organizations of all types and sizes, mm-hmm. right? community organizations, business, nonprofit, whatever. Um, for an organization to, to be able to sustain itself, maybe in the short term or thrive in the long term, what are some core components that that organization needs to do that, right? And one of the first things Rob and I talked about was Rob called it a problem to solve, right? An organization comes together to solve some sort of problem or okay. you know, solve some sort of pain point or fill some gap or need or even approve on a product or service, right? So everyone's got to, that's why organizations initially get together originally. And he, yeah. t- he even talked about softball, right? Rob coaches a softball team, a girls softball team. And you know, that organization exists to solve a problem, right? Give the kids an outlet to, to do things and come together and compete and, you know, form teams and everything. So, so that's kind of where we're at. We've been kind of all over the board, right, Rob, for the last hour but i'm glad you dropped in man i always put on the on the on the leadosophy page that come in and drop in or out whatever you want so thanks for coming in appreciate that if you got any uh, thoughts that come to mind throw them yeah so so my uh mind is going to immediately go over to the soft side to things like trust and uh, if you uh I was listening to a, the unrelated, a, something very different. It was Jordan Peterson talking about um, free speech. And he said that if you can't speak freely, you, you can't have free thought. And in organizations where you can't speak truth, to, now this is, that's the end of him. This is me now. In organizations where you now can't speak truth to power, you can't even think right. You can't be effective if, you, if you're not allowed to say something that might cross the boss's orthodox position or might hurt his feelings or something. So if you want effectiveness, it's, it, there's got to be trust. There's got to be an environment where you can actually speak truth to power. And when I don't see that, I know that there's huge red flags. Sure. That's, that's interesting you say that because one of the last things Rob and I talked about were, was information and knowledge flowing freely throughout the organization right? Mm-hmm. Being able to transparently do that. But I've been reading a book. Um, I, I don't know if either one of you are familiar with Chris Argyre. He was a psychologist, kind yep. of like organizational psychologist. Well, he wrote a book called Organizational Traps, right? And it mm-hmm. goes right to exactly what you're talking about, Darren. He talked about defensive reasoning and defensive mindsets that people have in the workplace and organizations. And people basically try to avoid um, embarrassing situations. And it's all self-preservation, right? At the end of the day, people default to self-preservation. So they're not going to tell their boss that this idea is dumb because it, they're, they're going to default to self-preservation, right? So it's one of the, he said it's one of the hardest things. He's, he'd seen it in 10,000 organizations that he'd, he'd been uh, a part of all over the globe. It's a, it's a global phenomenon, right? So how does an organization get past that need to self-preserve and not tell people what they really need to hear, right? How does an organization get beyond that? To have those hard conversations, transparent communication, it's very difficult, right? It's very yeah. difficult. So, it, so let me add a layer to that. Then there, um, when you have hierarchy, you create, and, and all organizations have hierarchy, but to the degree that hierarchy is more felt or less felt, you'll have different outcomes. So, um, uh, it, it's harder to speak truth with colleagues uh, or it's easier. So to the degree that you can minimize the effect of 
you know, like, I mean, in some organizations, you even wear like a different color hard hat to, to show or rank or whatever the equivalent is. But to the degree you can minimize that and be collegial uh, and foster a culture of collegiality, I think you'll get to more truth than not. Where, where people can see each other as uh, working with each other, not for other people, <laughs> uh, I think you'll see more of it than not. But again, my default is to start looking culturally at the, the softer side rather than um, looking at the, the systems within the organization. So, sure. And we talked about metrics because Rob admittedly said, you know, he, because Rob kind of runs a, a small business organization and, and, metrics is a part of that, right? An organization must at some, some level look at the metrics, the analytical side of their organization to judge effectiveness or to assess that effectiveness. And then we talked about the analytical side versus the human side. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Rob, if you have any thoughts to add on any of that, what we talked about. Yeah, I think the, the other side of that coin is um, if you're going to thrive, your team needs to believe that you want them to take risks. You want them to try things. And then if it doesn't work out, you're not going to be berated over it. You're not going to be punished over it. So you, you have to foster this environment where failure isn't the worst thing in the world. Failure is you trying and you realize that didn't work. But you go on. Yeah. Well, and Tim, how, how is your book on leading through intimidation coming along, by the way? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's satire. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's some would say that leading through intimidation, uh, some would argue that that's effective, right? I, I don't think it's a long term strategy. Yeah. Uh, but there are, I guarantee there are, there are leaders out there that lead that way. Or, oh, yeah. you know, they say they lead one way, but they actually lead the other way. Right? They say they, they care about people and, they value everyone's opinion, but when it comes down to it, just like Argyre said, they'll lead the other way. It was the espouse theories versus the theories in action or theories in use. All right, we say one thing, but we do something other. So, but yeah, I can browbeat my kids into doing just about anything I want them to do. But if I want to have a, a relationship with them when I no longer have power over them, better not do that. Yeah, that's right. So, the, yeah, the power strategy is not. It's not a way to create an inspirational environment within the organization. Nope. It's going to be, you know, I mean, people are going to beat down and like Rob said, you know, we were talking about McDonald's, right? It may work in the McDonald's environment and, you know, maybe an environment where attrition is easy because you're always going to have people coming in, right? So that may be sustained over the long run, but. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, people use the McDonald's example and I don't know. <laughs> Look, so I worked in the library when I was in grad school, and it's, it was essentially McDonald's, but with books, right? I mean, it was just, I mean, it was a pretty simple whatever. But I tell you what, my, the Karen Waite was the, the library supervisor. To this day, if Karen Waite called me on the phone and said, Darren, I need your help, I'd go through a wall for that woman because she cared about us. She treated us like her own kids. Hey, what's going on? I was in graduate school, right? What's going on? How, how did that paper come? How that? So you can McDonaldize anything probably, and you can also do awesome leadership, even in, in a McDonald's-like environment. Um, so I... <sighs> I don't know. I, uh, it's, I get what they're trying to do with McDonaldizing or with, you know, dummy proofing or what, whatever it is, but you can still be an awesome leader even there. Yeah. Rob said that Rob, Rob admittedly said that as well. It's, you can still treat people like humans, you know, and still have, That's right. time. It's like, we, we got to talking about that. Cause we were talking about is commitment required. Does your team need to be committed to, your purpose as an organization in order for your organization to survive. And my example was McDonald's. Do people go and work for McDonald's because they want to feed hamburgers to the nation or do they have other reasons, but they can still love that job and still be a great place to work. And a lot of that comes down to people and, and relationships. But just as you said, I don't yeah. have to love serving hamburgers to love my job at McDonald's because I might love the people I work with. They like me. They treat me well. They respect me. Exactly. Yeah. Both of my kids, uh, my oldest son would be a junior in college. He worked at Little Caesars his last two years in, in high school and was a manager at the end. And then my youngest uh, just finished his, his tour of duty at Dairy Queen. But uh, it's funny hearing 
their stories about their managers and the different personalities and, mm -hmm. and how they made them feel negative and yeah. positive, right? Even at 16 years old, 17 years old, like they are getting exposure to the business world and organizational world that I'm assuming Darren and Rob, that this is going to go with them. This is going to stick with them for the rest of their life, right? <laughs> There's some sort of impression that they had, right? The way they were treated, good or bad, may, may last or, you know, they may carry into how they treat people or whatever. So again, my daughter works, my daughter works at Chick-fil-A. And uh, so I hear these stories daily about what happened and what didn't happen. And she unpacks it as if she was in my class describing it. Like I've got her, I've got a train now to be looking for these things. So uh, this is okay, just so occupation, I gotta, I gotta, occupational hazard with me. <laughs> I got to stop so. you because Rob and I talked briefly about Chick-fil-A and we don't have any experience with Chick-fil-A, but we were talking about the culture, right? And we were talking about the different culture between McDonald's and Chick-fil-A where you know, they're more personable and Chick-fil-A mm -hmm. and they want you to have a good customer experience. Not that, you know, McDonald's doesn't want that, but it's just more prevalent. Uh, so no, there's, is there's it something into in the, the DNA. Culture? Yeah, it's built into there's, the culture, there, right? Yeah, there's something in the DNA. Come here, Gracie. So there, this is my, my, my daughter who actually works at uh, Chick-fil-A. So is she okay, with being, on, Come is she okay with being on the podcast? Yeah, she'll, she'll be fine. Oh, awesome. So, so. Tell this is them Gracie? what it's like. Yeah, this is Gracie. So Gracie. Tell, yeah, tell them what it's like to, to be at uh, at Chick Fil A, like the, the the culture of Chick Fil A that you've experienced. Yes. What's it like being at Chick Fil A? How does it make you feel? Um, it's great, honestly. Like I go to work. I so. Um, this is a little side note, but I used to work at a local barbecue joint, and when I went into work, I dreaded it. Like I, you know, I would get so nervous. My hands would shake, you know, my, my boss was bad. The management wasn't good. Um, and you know, my boss saw me as just, as just a worker, but here, chick, like here at where I currently work at chain of Light, they see me as more than an employer. Like they see me as valuable. You know, I, I look forward to going into work, you know, not just cause of the food, but <laughs> cause you know, I look forward to being around people who are positive and who will make me better than when I came in. Is it, do you feel like that because of the way like maybe your management team treats you, treats all everyone that works there? Is, it, is that what's going on? Yeah. So the management is really good. Um, the management is really good. And then like the, just the team members, like the people who I work with, because most, a lot of the management, you know, they, if, you know, if there's nobody on that day, they will do the jobs that are considered on the bottom. They will go outside. They will take out the trash. You know, they're not going to be like, oh, some management, you have to go do that. Like, they're not afraid to get they, in the trenches. No, they're not. And, you know, they really, they really act like servant leaders. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. I can tell you definitely know how to speak to leadership stuff too. That's, that's yeah. yeah. That's so, like I said, occupational hazard with me. So we <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I was just saying we debrief pretty much on the way home every day <laughs> when we're we're picking you up. So that's mm -hmm. awesome. Well, Gracie, you have a great role model at home too. So that's a role model is plural. I'm that's sure. true. That's, that's true. Awesome. I can say that. Well, thank you. Any other I'm just talking uh, about my mom. <laughs> so this podcast is not in any way sponsored by Chick Fil A. Just so everyone knows. But, that, yeah, <laughs> Disney. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks. we we appreciate it. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, thank you, thank yeah, you. It's awesome. nice to meet. You. That's awesome. Right. So we so we uh, we solved the Chick Fil A, Rob. Chick Fil A, uh, you yeah. know, it it out. organizational. Out. We were talking about organizational culture at Chick Fil A. We wonder how that kind of started, you know. And I was talking about it'd be interesting to see how that organization started, the genesis of that, and how it carried through. I don't know how long. Yeah, there's been, I don't know, there but. definitely is something in a culture. Uh, of the organization writ large, as well as at this local Ch Chick-fil-A. Um, the manager, once when I came in uh, to pick her up, uh, the owner rather, because it's, you know, owner operators that whatever came in and said, oh, you're Gracie's dad. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you have uh, lent her to us. Uh, it's clear that you're doing something right. Like, that's what he was telling me. Like, I was like, man, this guy, he, he, he understands how to like motivate people. And like he was, he was doing something right now in contrast, the place that she was just talking about before, it was just an independent barbecue place. 
but you could tell from the owner's actions that Gracie was just being used. Like, and there's nothing wrong with that to some degree. Like we, when we show up at work, we all have to have certain amount of productivity, but the owner couldn't see beyond that to see her as a person. Yeah. And you're a human being who has to ha have to give certain amount of utility in order to collect your paycheck. I get that the utility part, but you also have to see the person as an individual for that to be sustainable, to be uh, valued as a person, for it to be sustainable, to get everything out of them. Yeah, that's so, yeah, that's that's you put that very well because we did we briefly touched upon the dehumanizing work workplace and looking at people as kind of cogs in the machine. And yeah, to some expect we, we all have to uh, fulfill our purpose. We have to, we have a job to do. Right. Um, but you don't have to be a jerk about it, right? Exactly. I mean, you, so the way I put it in class is like, um, you know, we, we, do, we do this wrong because we like try to do things stupid. Like, well, let's measure how much time they, their, their butts in their chair as if that's any indication of actually getting things done. No, here's what you do. The, the road to productivity is if, if you as a leader, if you show that you have my back, you get my heart. Yeah. And then I'll go through, like I said, Karen, wait, I'd go through a wall for that lady. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Say that that's how it works because she cared about me. So I care in return and you get what you give. So it's, it's pretty much that simple to my mind, but I think it can be done pretty much every, anywhere. I don't know that that's necessarily a fact. I, I think it's harder to do that at TSA than it is in, in most other jobs. But I mean, there are some jobs that are just rough, right? But I think you can do it anywhere. Uh, it always goes back to my, one of the questions I've never been able to solve from a leadership perspective, and that's, is leadership hard or easy? I still haven't figured out an answer to that. So if you guys know the answer to that, let me know. <laughs> that, that is a true philosopher question. Tim. I think the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, you know, on it's the yeah, surface. Yes, it's, it's, like, it's both hard and easy. It depends yeah. on what part. But yes, I mean, and it's going to be hard at some times and easy at other times. And you can make it extra hard on you by unforced errors like the barbecue joint. And you can make it extra easy by doing the right things, which is what you're talking about. How do like if you if you sort out all the effectiveness issues that you were just talking about, it's a lot easier. Sure, that's true. I agree. All right. That's true. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's sometimes it's like the golden rule. You can always go default to the golden rule, right? Um, seems easy enough. Seems easy enough, but then you got this whole other side of organizations and management and metrics and all that stuff that has to happen for an organization to survive or thrive. So. Um, gentlemen, you got anything else, Darren? You got any? Rob, you're more than welcome to to, to head out if you need to. But Darren, you got any? Yeah, I was going to say I, I'm going to hop off because I'm down to two percent of my phone, and I don't want to just cut out immediately. So this was awesome. I appreciate you. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for your time, Darren. I'm super grateful that you you jumped in. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you both. Yeah, glad to see you again. Yeah, I, I'm going to shut up there and leave the audience wanting more. There you go. That's <laughs> perfect. And uh, like I said, I'm going to try, I try to do this about once a week now. So um, every week, hopefully be a little different topic. And you guys are always more than welcome to jump in at any time for however long you want. So I appreciate it. Great. All right, All right gentlemen, you guys have a great night. And uh, thanks again. Thanks. All right. All right. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Thanks for watching and listening to another episode of Leadosophy. If you liked what you heard today, hit that subscribe button. And check out Leadosophy.com and learn more about Tim's ideas on philosophy and leadership. We'll see you next time.